Good morning from the Episcopal Church of the Redeemer in Ruston, Louisiana, in the United States. This is session two out of eight on the Gospel according to Mark. Uh, we hope that you are on our YouTube channel, and uh, you can get to our YouTube channel by doing Ruston Redeemer, and then looking for the playlist called, got, called Gospel of Mark. Uh, and today's session is session two out of eight. Um, and so today we're looking specifically at Mark 116 through the end of chapter 4, although we will actually talk about Mark 1, 115, the summary verse. Um, this is a very brief summary of an outline of that Professor Fame Perkins of Boston College, in her excellent commentary on Mark in the New Interpreter's Bible, has provided. This is very, very brief, but basically she understands the Gospel of Mark primarily in two halves, and that is not unusual. Uh, a lot of people would think that something new begins in 827, because in 827 you have the confession of Peter, where Peter is the first to say to Jesus, you are the Messiah. Um, but anyway, interestingly enough, the focus in terms of geography in 1, 1 through 826 is Galilee. And Jesus is very popular in Galilee. And then in 827, with the confession of Peter, and then the first prophecy of the Passion in chapter 8, and then another one in chapter 9, and another one in chapter 10, and then Jesus is uh, on his way to Jerusalem, where Jesus will be rejected and put to death by the Romans, and then, of course, resurrected from the dead. And so one way of dealing with how do you figure out what's in Mark is just to look at it geographically, namely the Galilee focus and then the Jerusalem focus. Um, and that's another scholar has done quite a bit with that. Her name is Elizabeth Struthers Malbon. I believe it was called Narrative Space and Mythical Meaning in Mark. And she's written three or four other books on Mark. Elizabeth Struthers Malbon, and she taught for years at Virginia Tech. Um, what does Jesus do in 1, 2 through the end of, well, 826? First, Jesus is baptized by John the Baptist. Jesus goes to the shore of the Sea of Galilee, by the way, the Lake of Galilee. Um, by the way, the Lake of Kinnereth, or in the Gospel of John, it's the Lake of Tiberias. It's all the same body of water. Um, but it's the Sea of Galilee as we know it in the Synoptic Gospels. Jesus goes to the seashore of the Sea of Galilee, and he calls four disciples. And let's just say he's not very choosy. And then um, Jesus starts his ministry in Galilee of casting out demons, which is to say healing, uh, preaching the kingdom of God, providing food for crowds. He does the feeding of the 5,000, and then he does one more feeding, the feeding of the 4,000. He then walks on water, and generally he travels around Galilee. And Jesus becomes increasingly, increasingly popular in Galilee. He almost can't go anywhere because he attracts crowds, okay? Uh, and then in 827 through the end of chapter 15, by the way, the passion narrative is chapters 14 and 15. Um, and of course, the empty tomb story is 16, 1 through 8. But in 827 through the end of chapter 15, the focus in this second half of Mark is on Jesus' suffering. Jesus says to his disciples that his suffering is necessary. And then in chapter 8, in chapter 9 and chapter 10, Jesus predicts his suffering and death and resurrection. And ironically, Peter does not agree with Jesus as to what is going to happen to Jesus at the end of his life. And that's Peter's most glorious biblical moment uh, where Jesus calls Peter Satan. How about that? Um, and all of this happens in the capital city of Jerusalem. Um, the suffering and death uh, was inflicted by the Roman occupation government on Jesus, and this resulted in his 
uh, crucifixion and death on the cross, uh, which the Romans were completely responsible for. Um, one of the most important themes in Mark is the fact that Jesus is a worker of miracles. Every time Jesus turns around, especially in the first half of Mark, Jesus does miracles. Um, and in, in my view, miracles are very Christological. Christology is one of those 75 cent words. It means the study of what it is, who Jesus is. And then there is a related word called soteriology, which has to do with what Jesus did in order to save us, right? But the two are usually conflated into Christology. Namely, was Jesus the Messiah during his earthly life? Mark says yes. Paul doesn't say. And so uh, early Christians worshipped Jesus and understood him to be the Messiah. And Paul even quotes hymns that the early church used, like the hymn in Philippians 2, 5 through 11. Remember, at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Um, there's also a Christological hymn in one of the letters written in Paul's name after his death, the letter to the Colossians, chapter 1, 15 through 20, has a Christological hymn. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation, for from him and to him are all things. All things exist for him, and in him all things have their fulfillment. So the Christological hymn in Colossians 1, 15 through 20 is really important. The fullness of deity dwelt bodily in Jesus. So the early church worshipped Christ and sang hymns uh, that described Christ in terms of who Jesus was and is and also what he did to save us. So Christology is really important and miracles are very important to New Testament Christology because it shows you actually during Jesus' earthly life not waiting until his death and resurrection, but even during his earthly life, Jesus could work miracles. And so um, there is, we talked about the synoptic problem last week. In other words, Matthew and Luke using Mark as a source, which is the most likely um, theory of Matthew, Mark, and Luke in relation to each other. But also when you look at Mark itself, uh, it looks like Mark may also be drawing upon early sources for miracle stories, which, in other words, the early church told stories of what Jesus did. And that would suggest then that not only was, Math not only was Mark a source for Matthew and Luke, but also that there was a pre-Markan set of miracle stories, or in the words of the late Bud Octemeyer, um, a catena of pre-Mark and miracle stories. So there's, that used to be a big item of discussion. There's another 75 cent word that you need to know, and that is eschatology. Eschatos in Greek means last. And so eschatology is the understanding and study of what's going to happen at the end of time. In other words, will there be a last judgment? Will it be on heaven or on earth? Um, will Jesus be here to judge? And when exactly will it happen? That, those are questions that are part of eschatology. And also that famous saying in Mark, the first shall be last and the last shall be first. That's a very important statement. Uh, actually, you have that statement at the end of today's gospel in the parable of the laborers in the vineyards. So the first shall be last and the last shall be first. So uh, that probably is a statement, that little snippet probably is a saying that went back to the historical Jesus. So there used to be a big debate among New Testament scholars uh, really in the late 19th century uh, and in the early 20th century as to whether Jesus was an eschatological thinker. Did Jesus think that his coming was the prelude to the last times?
And most of us today think that, that the answer to that question is yes. And so uh, there was major contra controversy over that. Um, if you've ever read Albert Schweitzer's most famous book, The Quest of the Historical Jesus, it's all about the controversy of reconstructing the historical Jesus, mostly in the 19th century. And uh, toward the end, there is what's called thoroughgoing eschatology, and Johannes Weiss uh, wrote a little book called Jesus' Proclamation of the Kingdom of God, in which he demonstrated to most people's satisfaction that Jesus was an eschatological thinker. Right. Yes. Yes, Paul thought that. Paul thought in 1 Thessalonians 4 and 5, he believed that it would happen during his own natural lifetime. Um, by the time Paul writes his last letter, Romans, Paul is not clear that it's going to happen during his natural lifetime. And then by the end of the first century, the people in the early church have begun to, have begun to figure out it ain't going to be quite so soon. I used to tell the students it was between, expected to be between two weeks and two years. Um, so they expected it to be an imminent second coming. And uh, Jesus may have thought that himself. So um, if he didn't think that, then there's a lot that you can't explain very well in the Gospels, in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. By the time of the writing of the Gospel of John, uh, it has an eschatology that is different. It's called a fulfilled eschatology, namely the coming of Jesus, and right now is the coming of the kingdom of God. You believe in Jesus, you become a child of God right now. See? And that's a big deal in the fourth gospel. In Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and also in Paul, um, and their sources, uh, Jesus um, is, has not come back yet, but he will come back, and it's expected to be soon. Um, but anyway, Johannes Weiss argued in favor of what's called thoroughgoing eschatology. And he had a very famous student named Rudolf Bultmann, and he had a very famous student named uh, Ernst Käsemann, and he had one of his students, although he didn't dis direct the dissertation, but one of his students was my teacher, Robert Jewett. So, uh, you know, the mother country of biblical studies is Germany. <laughs> And so the, the Brits don't seem to think so for some reason. But nonetheless, um, all through the 19th century and, part of, and much of the 20th century, there has been this debate over whether Jesus is primarily an eschatological thinker, that the idea that the imminent coming of the kingdom of God permeates everything that Jesus said during his earthly life. And that's certainly what I believe. Some people at Oxford don't seem to believe that. Okay. Um, let's take a look at the summary verse. Took a look at 115. Chapter 1, verse 15. Well, look at verse 14. Now, after John was betrayed or after John was arrested, um, Jesus came to Galilee proclaiming the good news of God, the gospel of God, the evangelion. That's the word we translate gospel. And he was saying... And this is not thought to be a particular saying as much as it is thought to be a summary. The time is fulfilled, and the kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe the good news. So Jesus believed that in his very coming, the good news is coming near, and eventually the good news will, will result in the return of Jesus, the parousia, second coming of Jesus, in which there will be the, the resurrection of the dead so that there can be a final judgment. Uh, and then there will be the judgment of the good and the evil people. And so the kingdom of God in the coming of Jesus himself, the kingdom of God has come near, and therefore what human beings should do who hear the good news is they should repent and believe the good news. And the very beginning of Mark, probably the original title is the beginning of the good news of Jesus Christ. And then some manuscripts added Son of God. So this idea that 
the second coming is something that is imminent, uh, is what actually that's what chapter 13 of Mark is all about, it's called, which is called the little apocalypse. So this perspective that, the, that Jesus believed that the kingdom of God was going to come really, really soon and was already partly here in the coming of Jesus himself. That's a really important perspective. Let's, um, um, I've talked a little bit about that. We believe that Jesus' coming and his preaching have everything to do with what happens at the end of time and when the Son of Man, evidently equal to Jesus, returns to judge the world, okay? You understand that, you understand a lot about Mark. Now let's take a look at the call of the disciples and uh, that would be 1, 16 through 20. Would somebody read that? Would you call a rector for this parish that quickly? <laughs> Would you ordain somebody in the Episcopal Church that quickly? Oh, I don't think so. Um, Jesus goes and he sees fishermen by the sea and he says, okay, I'll take them. Um, does that say something negative or does that begin the kind of negative image of the disciples, which we see, as I believe, consistently in Mark? I mean, does anybody really go by the sea? I mean, Admittedly, he was Jesus, right? But does anybody really go by the seashore and say, okay, I'll pick him and him, and he goes a little farther, and I'll pick them and him and him. So what's important is that there's, at least according to Mark, no painstaking selection process of the disciples. I mean, he didn't go to the synagogue and ask the rabbi, can you give me four of your best yeshiva boys? Um, and so Jesus was omniscient, okay, but there's no process guiding his selection of the right people to be the apostles. And I see this, and I'm sure many people disagree with me, but I see this as part of Mark's rhetoric about the disciples, that the disciples as a whole are generally pretty disastrous. And that's one of the things that Matthew kind of edits out. When Matthew uses Mark as a literary source, a written source, in Matthew, the apostles are not so bad. They're actually good students. And Jesus is primarily, in Matthew, a teacher. Whereas in Mark, Jesus is primarily a miracle worker. And the disciples see the miracles, and then it ain't too clear that they are really good students. So that's my reading of Mark, and everybody, don't, everybody doesn't agree with that. Um, but I, I wonder if the Gospel of Mark is saying to the readers of Mark that the disciples are the way they are, and we're going to hear a lot more about the way they are, especially in the second half of Mark. But was Mark saying to the readers that the disciples are the way they are because Jesus did not really use any judgment whatsoever in their selection? On the other hand, Jesus knows things and can do things that the rest of us can't do, such as throw out demons and therefore heal people. So that's a really good question right there. One of the things that, that blows people's minds in college when they take a course like this, or seminary, is that they want to read the Bible and they want to get all the answers. And uh, when people like me read the text of the Bible, yeah, I can see some answers, but I see plenty of questions. I see more questions than answers. Um, and so that's the way that, that people like me look at the Bible is that we see certain things, and yeah, there are answers in the Bible in terms of my personal faith, but in terms of what Mark is saying about the apostles or in terms of what Mark is saying about Jesus, there are questions there that, that are questions that are raised, I think, intentionally in the reader's minds by the writer of Mark. Now, that, this brings us to the form of miracle stories. Johannes Weiss's student, the great Rudolf Bultmann, my teacher's teacher's teacher, uh, became very famous for form criticism. A form is a little genre, okay? And so the miracle stories follow a form which has been shown to have its roots in oral miracle stories. And uh, de Baileus, Martin de Baileus, thought of them as novellen or tales, as he referred to them. 
But then Bultmann, in his history of the synoptic tradition, uh, showed the parallels between uh, rabbinic and other stories of miracles. Um, and if you read in the history of the synoptic tradition, you will see many, many, many parallels to miracle stories. And so when, since you see parallels to miracle stories, and these miracle stories are very cross-cultural, the impression that I have always gotten in reading Bultmann is that these uh, miracle stories had a place in the oral teaching of the church before they were written down. And if you can show that these stories uh, first arose most likely in oral tradition, that actually historically gets you closer to the historical Jesus, see? So what we're really interested in is, okay, we're reading the text of Mark. What we would really like to know, in addition to what Mark said, what we'd really like to know is what did Jesus say and in what way does the gospel, ways does the Gospel of Mark reflect what the Jesus of history actually said and did? So that's the question of the historical Jesus. So as far as I'm concerned, that question has never gone away. In miracle stories, you have a form. This is the form of a miracle story. Every single miracle story doesn't always have each of these elements of the form, but most of them have at least about four of them. There's the setting of the miracle, including the geographical setting where Jesus was near, he was near the Sea of Galilee or wherever, or the need for the miracle. In other words, so-and-so was sick, and just how sick were they, right? And then frequently a dialogue between the healer, Jesus, and the others in the story, sometimes the person being healed or the family of the person that needs to be healed. Um, there's a dialogue, and in the dialogue, there is more information about how sick the person is or how in need of feeding. In other words, they're hungry because they've been out in, the, in the, out in the wilderness for a long time. They're really hungry. So those dialogues are important to give you more um, information about why the miracle is necessary. And then Jesus has words and or gestures of healing. Mark loves to preserve Aramaic words, uh, talitha kum, little girl arise, or ephata, be opened. Uh, he loves those Aramaic words and phrases, and Matthew usually edits them out. Uh, and then you can see usually that the reader can see by reading the next couple of verses, the person got up and walked. <laughs> the little girl got up and asked for something to eat. In other words, the reader is told by um, the story, this miracle, after Jesus did the healing gestures and the healing words, uh, boom, hey, it really worked, you know, the zap. Um, uh, and so the proof to the reader that the miracle really happened. And then frequently, although not always, but frequently there is the reaction to the miracle on the part of the disciples or on the part of those who saw it or heard it. We have never seen anything like this. Um, in the Gospel of John, there's only seven miracles. But remember at the first miracle in Cana of Galilee, at the after there's all this wine that Jesus made, um, the disciples saw what Jesus did and the disciples believed. See, John 2.12, see? So the reaction to the miracle is very important. And uh, sometimes Matthew extends Mark and miracle stories and adds a little bit more to the reaction to the miracle. And for example, the, the famous story of the, st the stilling of the storm, which is a Markan story, Jesus at, uh, in Matthew says, okay, it, Peter says, if it's really you, have me come to you on the water. And Jesus says, okay, come to the water. This is none of that's in Mark. That's added by Matthew. And so Jesus has Peter start walking on the water. And then Peter sees the waves. And then when he sees the waves, he doesn't believe anymore. And then he starts to sink. And then Jesus gets him up, right? Um, and so 
in that famous story of the stilling of the storm in Matthew, Gunter Bornkam, in his famous article, shows that that miracle story was at least partially transformed into a discipleship story in Matthew. Namely, when Peter believed, he was walking successfully on the water. When he quit believing, he, he sank in the water. That's all about discipleship, see? And that was, ed, that was added by Matthew. So the reaction to the miracle is very important, especially in Matthew, but you find it in Mark too. So why are miracle stories important? Well, they have their roots in miracle stories or deeds of power in the Hebrew Bible. Um, the Hebrew Bible is what we usually now call the Old Testament. Jesus' miracles have important parallels in the Elijah-Elisha cycle of miracle stories in 1 Kings 17 through 2 Kings 13. Uh, the notion that Jesus did miracles during his earthly life appears to be a well-established tradition. It's already an oral tradition before Matthew, excuse me, Mark gets it. And it's not hard at all for us to visualize in early churches that there were these very, very tellable miracle stories. What did Jesus do? Well, the miracle stories are, the miracles are what Jesus did. It's not hard to visualize those being told and told and told and retold for decades before they ever were written down in the gospels that we have. And so, by the way, we also don't know how Jesus did the miracles. Uh, sometimes schoolboys and schoolgirls like to speculate, you know, about Jesus walking on the water. Well, he knew where the rocks were, you know. Well, that, 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 the, the, the most notorious one is the feeding of the 5,000 is that they were hiding their food under their, under their bathrobes. Doesn't, didn't, doesn't everybody know that people wore bathrobes in the Bible? And so they were, they were hiding their food under the bathrobes and then after they had listened to the, the fatherhood of God and the brotherhood of man, they became generous. And so instead of a transformation of the loaves and the fishes, it becomes a transformation of the hearts of the people who suddenly become, genu who suddenly become generous. And then they start sharing their food, and that's how they fed 5,000 people. That's the Sunday... That's a Sunday school edition. And I used to tell that in Barbados and Trinidad, and they... And all these people would say, yeah, that's what I learned in Sunday school. So uh, in any event, even Bob Jewett told me that. And I never heard that in Presbyterian Sunday school, but he must have heard it in Methodist Sunday school. Well, I don't know. Nonetheless, it explains away the miracle. It explains away the miraculous, see? Um, so uh, it, it's a very poor uh, interpretation. But now, if you look, we're going to go a little faster now. Jesus is uh, teaching in the synagogue in Capernaum in 1, 21 and 22. Um, uh, Kelly, would you read those two verses? Okay. So Jesus goes to Capernaum, which is also in Galilee. It's near the, it's near the um, Sea of Galilee. And they were struck by his teaching. He taught as one with authority and not like the scribes, which is a description of rhetorical success. And then, of course, there is the exorcism in the synagogue um, in Capernaum, where, of course, the idea that the people are sick is because they have daimons. In Greek, daimon, a daimon, demon, a daimon is, it can either be good or be evil in antiquity. Um, and so the, re the one way that healing is described is the demon or the daimon is thrown out. And in order to, and that is the big deal in magic. And in magic, you need somebody with a stronger daimon to throw out the weaker daimon and the person that needs to be healed. Um, daimons or daimones can inhabit things and can inhabit human beings. In Greek tradition, the daimon can be either good or evil. Uh, and this is, daimon is a Greek word. And so they cause disease and you get healed by exorcising the daimon from the sick person. This may be a variant of the idea in the Old Testament that diseases were given by God as a punishment for sin. And then the forgiveness of sin should result in the healing of the sick person. And that's very interesting in the healing of the paralytic uh, 
uh, because he said before he says you're you're get you're healed now, he says your sins are forgiven. So there is in the Old Testament and to some extent in Jesus the idea that sin is somehow in the background in relation to the evil. I mean, a daimon is the is a being that is the personification of evil. So the real question is what is evil and who is evil? And then the healing of Peter's mother-in-law, uh, you have the same situational uh, thing, the geographical setting. After they come out of the synagogue, they go into Simon and Andrew's house. Simon is the one who will be given the name Peter, Petros. And Simon's mother-in-law is sick with a fever. People in the house are told, told of the sickness, though no dialogue is here. The gesture, Jesus took her by the hand and raised her up. The proof of the miracle is that she was restored to health so that she served the guests in her house, and that is according to the norms of first century hospitality. If you're the lady of the house, you serve the guests in your house, or the servants that you supervise serve the guests. And so this is in a private home, so there's no crowd reaction. Then you have the healing of the sick at evening. Um, Gene Boring in his commentary in the New Testament library points out that it was on Sunday evening, uh, a Saturday evening, and of course the day begins with evening. And so Saturday evening, the Sabbath is over. And so people could then bring their sick and weaken people to Jesus. And so the sun has set so, the new, so people can bring their, their people to Jesus. Um, and so Jesus heals publicly on the eve of Sunday rather than on the Sabbath. And so this summarizes multiple healings rather than a single healing miracle. And then Jesus departs from Capernaum. He says, well, I, I've been doing that here in Capernaum. Now I want to go these other places too. And so then that becomes the preface to the first preaching tour in Galilee. Jesus was preaching in the synagogues in the whole of Galilee. He's no longer limited to one town. Now he preaches in all the synagogues of the whole region. And so his preaching ministry includes healing, that is, casting out demons. Uh, you have the healing of the leper. By the way, the modern disease called leprosy is usually called Hansen's disease, um, which is a neurological disease, and it is treated with sulfa drugs. Before there were sulfa drugs, there was not any good treatment for Hansen's disease. But ancient leprosy is an inflammatory, scabby skin disease, and it was, it was um, very catchable, um, communicable. And so this leper wants healing. He has to say, unclean, unclean, so that people will not get near him. And so Jesus tells the man to keep silent about his healing and to have his healing verified by the priest, as in the Torah, and then he doesn't do that. And this illustrates the reality of the healing. And so the result of this man spreading the news that Jesus could heal him and did heal him of his leprosy means that Jesus could no longer go out openly. And people then were coming to Jesus. And then uh, if you looked at the thing last week uh, on this in parallel columns, in my little translation, you have the healing of the paralytic in Mark 2, 1 through 12. And there should be some copies here. And so this is the beginning of the contra controversies. In Barbados, I probably would have said controversies. Uh, controversies involving Jesus and Jewish authorities. And so the controversial part is that Jesus says that the paralytic sins are forgiven. Normatively, only God forgives sins, right? But when Jesus says your sins are forgiven, that is an assertion of his authority as the Son of God. And you can see that they were all amazed and glorified God, and they said, we have never seen anything like this. And so if you see this, I gave you the parallel between Matthew 9, 1 through 8, Luke 2, 1 through 12, and I mean Mark 2, 1 through 12, and then Luke 5, 17 through 26. You can see that Luke doesn't do much editing, a very light editing at all. A little bit of editing, but not much. Matthew does a more profound editing, and gives you a lot of the, takes away a lot of the more graphic details. And if you really think that Mark does, if you have doubts about Matthew, Matthew and editing, uh, next week we will look at the healing of uh, the, 
the uh, exorcism of the uh, Gadarene demoniacs, where you have this repeated, long description of all the graphic details of how crazy and how demon possessed this man is. And he's got a, le he's got a demon named Legion, and a Legion can be as many as 4,000 Roman soldiers, right? So he's got many, 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 many deacon demons. And so then it's very long in Mark, and Matthew makes it relatively shorter, and Luke does too. Um, and neither of them like the idea of the saying is, my name is Legion, singular, for we are many, plural, in the same sentence. And so they both, Matthew and Luke, edit that out. Okay, But that's in Mark 5, 1 through 20. Um, anyway, you have the call of Levi. Levi is a Jew, and he's a tax collector, which means he's a collaborator with the Roman authorities, and he takes his cut off the top. Um, anyway, there was serious enmity against tax collectors, and they apparently were not welcome in synagogues because they were really helping the Roman occupation government rip off fellow Jews in Israel. So they were very unpopular. Um, then, of course, 2, 18 through 22 is the question about fasting. Um, um, the disciples of Jesus evidently do not observe fasting, whereas Jew, most Jews in antiquity did fast. Uh, and then there's more about fasting in the parable of the wedding guests. Uh, and Jesus says, well, wait a minute. You're, you're, these uh, disciples of mine, they are like the bridegrooms. Uh, they are part of the wedding party, and they, can't, they cannot fast when the bridegroom is with them, meaning Jesus, see? Um, so, and also the third of those parables, the old and new wineskins, uh, is really the same kind of thing. How can you bring in the new teaching of Jesus and put it in the old wineskins of how we've always done things within, within Judaism as then known? And so the parable of the new wineskins, if you pour the new wine into the old wineskins, the old wineskins will burst. Uh, and those of us in churches that have always tried to do, to to argue in favor of new things. We clergy love new things, have you noticed? Some of us do. We always love this parable because we say, well, I'm trying to do these new things and therefore we, gotta, we can't do this new stuff by pouring the new wine in the old wineskins because it won't be good for the old wineskins. So maybe we not, not only need to do new, new things, but we need to do them in new ways. And so if you are a member of the clergy, you're very familiar with this parable. Um, but the real deal is if you try to do too many new things at once in a church, um, people will hate your guts. <laughs> and if you ask me how I know, I'd be happy to tell you, but you don't want to hear it. Okay, not here, but elsewhere. Um, and then, of course, what else does the, the disciples do? Well, Jesus tells them to pluck grain on the Sabbath. Well, if you're plucking grain on the Sabbath, you're working, right? Uh, you're not supposed to do any work on the Sabbath. And you go out into the fields and pluck the heads of grain and eat the heads of grain, then um, you're working. And so that's a, dis that's a violation of one of the commandments. Can't do that. And so, on the other hand, the disciples plucking grain was to satisfy a human need, the need for food to preserve life. See? So the pronouncement of this pronouncement story in informed criticism, this is called a pronouncement story, and the argument was everything up to the pronouncement at the end was sort of added by the evangelist, and the pronouncement of the pronouncement story was something that Jesus really said, see? That's what form criticism argued. And so the pronouncement of this pronouncement story, or the punchline, is the Sabbath was made for people. An anthropos is a human being, and not the anthropos made for the Sabbath. And so this pronouncement by Jesus prioritizes human need over particular Torah observance. So it prioritizes the human need is even more important than the ritual observance 
of the prohibition against work on the Sabbath. Then, of course, there is the man with the withered hand. He gets healed on the Sabbath. Um, this, the, by healing the man with the withered hand on the Sabbath day, that work preserves life. And so that is more important than the, than the prohibition against work. And then, of course, in Mark 3, Jesus heals multitudes. This is not a single healing story, but it's a narrative about healings done by the sea. Um, Jesus made the decision not to be in a particular city or town because he gets mobbed, to be out in the country by the shore of the lake. And one of the things about being by the shore of the lake is you can get in the boat and escape. So he doesn't want to be crushed by the crowds, and so he has them borrow a boat so he can preach to the people from the safety of the boat. But in this case, the boat was not used. And Jesus heals many, which suggests that he was using gestures of healing, including touching, etc. And so you could argue that the passage is an elaboration on the miracle story form, focusing on the extent of the crowd reaction. See? And then you remember earlier in chapter 1, Jesus chose the first four disciples, and now he chooses the twelve. Previously, he calls Simon and Andrew, James and John, but now he, in this passage, he chooses the twelve whom he indeed or whom he also named apostles. Okay. Then after that, Jesus is thought to be crazy, which is to say he's thought to have a daimon. And of course, that's easy to think because he was able to heal people. And in magic, you have a stronger daimon so that you can heal people with a weaker daimon by throwing the weaker daimon out. And so it's not hard to believe that the family of Jesus would have been embarrassed by him and they actually go and try to seize him because people had been saying that Jesus was beside himself. And so um, that would make sense given the ancient understanding of how healing takes place through the exorcism of demons. And this criticism would be a real reason that Jesus thought the center of his ministry was teaching and preaching. The early church would not have wanted Jesus to be associated primarily with healing because healing is what was done by magicians. Um, and so this was a reason in favor that I would argue that Jesus did the healings because it is not something the early church would have been proud of that Jesus was constantly casting out demons. Remember the criticism? It is by Satan himself that he casts out demons. And then Jesus responds with the famous house divided uh, saying, if Satan is being cast out by Satan, then Satan is the house that cannot stand. So there's this, there's this oral tradition uh, known to Mark that Jesus was doing healings, but Mark wants to emphasize Jesus did healings, yes, but he actually primarily did healing, <coughs> did teaching. And Matthew does that, he writes that large in the Gospel of Matthew, and he also, and that's also true in Luke, but especially in Matthew. Jesus is primarily a teacher in Matthew. And then there is the um, collusion with Satan. Uh, we've already talked about that. It's, people said it's because he has a demon that he can cast out demons. Well, a lot of people thought that about healers in antiquity. And then the sin against the Holy Spirit. Ooh, this one bugs people. Pastorally, this, this one really bugs people. In 328, it says this. Jesus says, truly I tell you, people will be, will be forgiven for their sins and whatever blasphemies they utter. But whoever blasphemes against the Holy Spirit can never have forgiveness, but is guilty of an eternal sin, for they had said he has an unclean spirit. The sin against the Holy Spirit is blasphemy, which is to say that God, the good creator of good, God does something that is evil. If you say God does something that is evil, you are committing blasphemy. To say that God does something evil is a total contradiction of what the Jewish tradition teaches about God. Since God is sovereign, God can forgive sins. If one says that God does evil, then one is disallowing God the ability to forgive sins, 
and bring about good. So if you think that God does evil, then there can't be any forgiveness of your sins. Because if God is evil, God cannot forgive you your sins. See? Um, and then uh, who are the mother, who is the family of Jesus? They want to come and snatch Jesus, take him home, because they say he, it is said that he is beside himself. Um, Jesus actually looks at those people and he, sa he says, oh, your family is here, they want to come and get you. And he says, who is my mother and brother and sisters? It is the will, those who do the will of God that are my mother and sister and brothers. So it's not my blood family that is my real family. My real family is anybody who does the will of God. That's a very radical statement, see? Uh, but it's consistent with the new wine, new wineskin saying earlier. God's will takes precedence over normal human relationships, including over Jesus' family relationships. Um, I certainly have preached about the parable of the sower. In Germany, this parable is known as the parable of the fourfold field. Um, the seed doesn't change, but there's different fields that, you throw the, that the sower throws the seeds into. And the, um, th this parable does two things. One, it allows the reader to understand the fact that evangelism will be successful in some places and not necessarily successful in other places. Because some people are willing to hear and do something about what they hear, the gospel. And other people are so set in their ways, they're stiff-necked. They're set in their ways, they're not going to do anything. Or some people are so taken up by other things that they're not going to listen. And so even though they hear the word of God, it's not going to do them any good. Or the people that hear it and then they're in church three times a week and then after three months they're gone. See? Those are people like the soil that has no depth. So it allows the reader to understand that there are going to be different places that will be very receptive to the gospel and some that will not. Um, and every priest can tell you that. And also it allows the reader or the hearer to consider for himself or herself what kind of soil I am. In other words, if I'm a really lousy piece of soil, maybe that's a reason that I'm not making a lot of progress in my Christian life. Imagine that. So the parable of the sower can be seen in either of two ways. It can be seen in terms of the outward success or non-success of evangelism, or it can also be seen in terms of the reader or listener asking, uh, people asking themselves, what kind of soil am I for the gospel to be implanted in? And either one is a, a very important lesson. And then Jesus speaks in parables. Um, the, the reason Jesus speaks in parables, it emphasizes that there's a kind of an insider knowledge of parables as well as an outsider knowledge of parables. By the way, in Mark, the disciples have to have the parables explained to them privately by Jesus. Um, but the, inward, the inner people, the, gospel, the disciples, the apostles, are the ones to whom are given the mystery of the kingdom of God. And so, of course, if you are reading Mark or you are hearing Mark, you become an insider. Because there will be not only the parable said by Jesus, there will also be the interpretation of the parables by Jesus, including the next passage, which is the interpretation of the parable of the sower. Um, in other words, the seed is the word of God, and the, the different kinds of people are equated with the different kinds of soil. That's the interpretation of the parable of the sower. And there used to be a big debate about whether that interpretation of the parable of the sower's act sower actually went back to the historical Jesus. Um, and then, of course, he who has ears to hear, let that person hear. Um, and Fame Perkins, as well as others, seem to think that these parables in 421 through 25 um, were not originally together, but they were sort of brought together in Mark. For example, 421, he said to them, is a lamp brought in to be put under a bushel basket or under the bed and not on a lampstand? For there is nothing hidden except to be disclosed, 
nor is anything secret except to come to light. Let anyone will, with ears uh, with ears to hear listen. And he said to them, pay attention to what you hear. And so verse 24 seems to start a different set of sayings. And so uh, it's easy to look at 21 and 22 and 23 as hanging together very nicely. And then 24 and 25, uh, different proverbs that don't really fit with 21 through 23. Um, then there is the parable of the seed growing secretly. Uh, and this parable is all about the seed grows very secretly. The, sometimes the farmer doesn't do anything to the, to the uh, seeds, but boom, they really grow. And that illustrates the power of God in contrast with the work of human beings. And then there's the parable of the mustard seed. Well, we have gone over our time, and so sorry about that. But um, next week, we will, um, we will um, consider more of the parables and miracle stories in Mark chapter 4. And we will go all the way through 435 through 826.